Hello and welcome everybody, I'm Rapal Paverian and this is Victoria 3's Dev Diary number 56. Today we have culture and religions and this one is, if you followed the Victoria 3 Dev Diaries quite proactively, I think something that isn't too surprising. We already knew most of these things, but there are certain things in here that are now clarified with this Dev Diary and maybe even more importantly, there's a pretty neat cultural map mode in here. Um, we're going to take a look at all of that, so definitely something exciting to look forward to. The other thing before we jump in that I wanted to mention is that you should not forget that on the 30th, Paradox will be streaming on their Twitch channel and they will be playing the Netherlands in Victoria 3 and will be announcing the release date of Victoria 3 as well. So quite something to look forward to, I think. Um, I'm very excited for it. I would love to know when the release date is. My guess, I'm going to lock it in right now, is somewhere in October. Whether that is true, we will find out on the 30th. Um, and then, of course, a couple days after the 30th, I will be in Sweden, I will be in Stockholm, I will be playing Victoria 3 and then afterwards give you feedback uh, and tell you whether I liked it or disliked it and if you have the same general habits and opinions on grand strategy games then that might even be something that helps you make a decision when it comes to Victoria 3 itself. Uh, with that being said, let's jump into the dev diary and talk about culture and religions. My name is Alex and I'm part of the QA team working on Victoria 3. Today the topic at hand is something that you likely have heard a lot about in previous dev diaries but that still deserves its own introduction, cultures and religion. As you probably already know from one of our very first dev diaries, pops have a series of aspects that define and group them. These include where the pops live, what profession they have and what buildings they work in. On top of that, pops are also defined by their cultural and religious background. Right here. We have a tooltip that we have, I think, seen a number of times already. This is the cultural tooltip. It shows, basically on the top, it shows some information that is general. This is just the informa uh, information about the Japanese culture. And then down here we have information that is very specific to the tag that is currently looking at this culture directly. So, let's take a look at it. Cultural traits, Yamato and East Asian heritage. Um, I believe Yamato is or was the, the cultural origin of mainline Japanese culture. Basically the proto-culture, right? So the general cultural group. And then we have East Asian heritage right here. The religion of this culture is in majority Mahayana and Shinto. Uh, and then the obsession and taboo. There sadly, or there currently are none whatsoever. Japanese culture is not discriminated in Japanese shogunate. There are 31 million Japanese people in the Japanese shogunate itself. It is a primary culture. There is no migration target and there is currently no turmoil. Uh, the thing that I want to point out here is that in... The case of Japanese culture, I would be very surprised if Yamato was a trait that any other culture has, which means that they basically just have it to use it in a law to actively discriminate against other cultures. Usually, the non-heritage cultures are utilized to have similarities. So, for example, South German and North German, I mean, that's unfair, they actually both are German heritage as well, right, or Germanic heritage, whatever. But there are certain cultures that say, okay, we don't have the same heritage, but we have the same trait. We're going to see that actually below with the uh, Nepali culture, I believe. And those would then still be accepted, even if you do not have the same heritage and, you know, would discriminate because they otherwise don't have the same heritage. Uh, with the Japanese here, yeah, I'm just not sure. Uh, I feel like this doesn't really fulfill a purpose, but we're going to talk about that in a second when it comes to the discrimination of or between cultural groups. So, let's talk about religion first. Both of these, so culture and religion, work by having a set of traits that define how closely related different cultures and religions are. These traits are what determine if a culture or religion will be accepted or discriminated against based on the different laws that you might have in your country. As an example, both Catholicism and Protestantism have the Christian trait, meaning that they accept each other under the freedom of conscience law, because they're both in the same religion group, right? That is, if you have that law, they're both Christian. I assume that, for example, Orthodoxy, that uh, the Apostolic Church, that all of those would also still be accepted in a country that has freedom of conscience, whereas, for example, Islam, whereas Shinto, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism and such would not be accepted. This requires, so this law, freedom of conscience, requires a shared trait between the religions but not under the state religion law, a law under which only pops of the state religion itself are accepted. So their traits do not matter. Catholicism will discriminate against Protestantism and vice versa, depending on what religion your tag has. The last alternative is, of course, the total separation law, which accepts all religion no matter what, uh, what traits they have. Makes perfect sense. I think... Um, for the reasoning here, so there are three laws ultimately. There's the law of freedom of conscience, there's state religion, and there's total separation, right? Uh, state religion is the harshest, then freedom of conscience, where it's at least your religious group that is accepted, and then the last one is total separation, where everything is fine. All of these make perfect sense. I think they work out perfectly fine for Victoria 3's time frame, for Victoria 3 as a vanilla game. I hope, and I think that this is the case, I, I would be very surprised if you couldn't mod this in, but I hope that you can, for example, take... Uh, very aggressively 
anti-religion in general stance, right? Instead of accepting everybody, you dismiss everybody. Uh, that would be probably much more attractive in, for example, the question of a, you know, a, a Cold War mod, uh, a total war, uh, a total war, a total conversion mod that is in the in the far-flung future, that is in a modern day where you have a very aggressive, for example, dictatorship. Let's let's take a look, and to a degree, it still goes into religion there and accepts it in a. Uh, political way, but look at, for example, North Korea, where you have a very ideological, uh, ideologically driven sort of society that get re gets reorganized under a religion that is based on the ideology itself rather than a classic religion as it existed. Uh, no matter how we look at this, I believe that surely there would be a different law, or maybe you could just even use these laws as they are. You just need to make basically a political state religion, add that to the tag, and then go under the law of state religion law, right? Uh, either way, I think this is a nice modular system. It also recognizes that religion is not something that will drive you primarily most of the time. Obviously, if you're the Pope, then it will drive you quite a lot if you're the Caliph, right? Uh, but it is something that largely just accompanies the gameplay that you have, the gameplay itself being, of course, society-focused. Um, so religion here plays a nice modular role. You can modify it, and I'm quite happy with what we have there in terms of laws. Now, this is a cultural map, and I love that we get a cultural map. We so far only had maps that showcased which culture had the most political power, political uh, uh, influence, right, in a particular state region. Now, this one is the actual culture maps when it comes to the majority culture in these regions. I gotta tell you, I'm not an expert in, in most uh, areas, so I can't really take a look at these and say this is accurate, this is inaccurate. I have no idea. Uh, I just like really seeing this map, honestly. It, it definitely feels quite diverse. It feels quite interesting to actually, uh, for example, you know, build an Indonesian empire because it is indeed so diverse. I would assume that most of these, for example, have a common heritage trait, but may have uh, individual traits that would then lead to exclusion being a law that you could have where they would still discriminate against one another or accept one another and discriminate against everybody else. I really, really am looking forward to the perspective of actually playing in, uh, you know, an area that is quite diverse when it comes to this. Now, the difficulty of a diverse cultural slash ethnic area, of course, is that uh, we have some state regions that have a very, very large and very specifically localized minority culture that isn't necessarily depicted in the right way. I'm going to get to that in a second. Let me just first say I, I absolutely love just how diverse and alive Africa is in this. Victoria 2 did not do any justice to Africa in this regard, and I think that this should really then lead to what we saw in real life, where you have the situation of you have these cultural and, and, and uh, ethnic borders, of course, and they go completely disrespected by the colonizing powers. Uh, I think the potential there, the influence that this could have, and the impact that this leaves, you know, uh, on the world map and on one given playthrough should be quite interesting. I'm, I'm in love that this actually got as much love as it did from Paradox right here. Now, the thing that I'm talking about is that and, and this is something that I know a bit more about, so I, I think I can at least speak to it somewhat. But the thing that I'm talking about is when it comes to the question of are all the cultures and their local uh, realities, are they emulated, are they presented in a way that makes perfect sense and that is completely reasonable? And that is where I'm not entirely certain. So what I mean is, for example, when we look at Bohemia, Bohemia is obviously majority Czech, right? Uh, makes perfect sense. It's a Czech homeland, but the entirety of Bohemia, and we know this because in the unification play, Bohemia is listed. If you want to unify Germany, Bohemia is an eligible state region to have under your control that then becomes a part of Germany, right? Uh, Bohemia is also, it appears, a homeland of the South German culture. And that is a bit odd. I'm, you know, obviously there's a lot of intermingling, there's a lot of like influence in particular under the Austrian crown. This is part of the Austrian core lands, of the Austrian crown lands rather than the Hungarian crown lands, right? Um, when we look at Bohemia, I do think, and this was debated, this was brought up and discussed by Martin Anwar as well, I want to say half a year or more back, um, we talked about the, the topic of potentially having cultural minority states, so to speak. So, for example, Bohemia itself being a core land of German culture, to me, is pretty questionable. What I mean here is that the German minority in Bohemia was highly, highly localized in the border regions. So in particular in, in the Erzgebirge, in the Sudeten and so on and so forth, right? And them viewing the entirety as Bohemia as a homeland makes it so that Germany can grab the entirety very easily and indeed view it as their homelands where then different laws for migration and, and uh, 
you know, for example, discrimination, but also uh, for, for actual assimilation applied. And I find that a bit odd, because realistically speaking, it wouldn't be all of Bohemia. The, the problem that I see on this culture map, you know, obviously we know that there are certain pops that live in Bohemia that are German and that view it as their homelands, and, and that is the way it is, but since it is just Bohemia, rather than Bohemia is a state and then, you know, like core Bohemia I should say is a state, and then you have the substate of uh, the, the surrounding German minority area, since that isn't the case, what will happen if I build a building in Bohemia is that the German minority that was very, very, again, very localized, and there was a German minority in, in Prague as well, it has to be said, but we're in particular, of course, talking about the Sudeten Germans, but this minority won't actually be localized in the region that they actually lived in, right? If, if I build a building and they start working there, it's German pops there because they're not discriminated against, so they will pick up the job, they have enough money to get the qualification because it's the Austrian Empire, you don't discriminate them, they will pick up the job in Prague, and all of a sudden, all of them work in Prague, right? Uh, my issue with this fundamentally really just is that we're looking at a situation where the minorities are depicted as though they lived all over that state, fundamentally, and that can't be changed. And I think this is a case, and again, I can't really judge, uh, for example, the, the uh, East Asian cultural makeup because I don't know enough about it. I'm very ignorant when it comes to this because it's just something that I don't have enough knowledge on. But when it comes to Europe, for example, I feel weird about this because this still means, since there is no cultural state region, uh, this means that the uh, Sudeten Germans will live anywhere in Bohemia. They're basically just Bohemia Germans, if you will. And you have the same situation, of course, here in Western Romania with the Hungarian population, with the German population. You have the same situation in particular here in uh, the Serbian area, in the uh, Bosnian, uh, in, in the Croatian area and such, where the intricacies of location-based differences in the state regions isn't really emulated because at any given moment, the German pop that actually lives right here, you know, at the at the border, will actually work and, and live in Prague. At any given moment, you know, for example, a pop that would live in a very particular ethnic and slash cultural uh, uh, region here would actually move to the big city because that is where, where the work is. I, I really wish that we had a greater distinction there. I know that this is basically like it's a slippery slope in the sense where all of a sudden you need to have these uh, states everywhere all over the world because I'm sure that... I know only of these examples, but that there are many other examples where we have this effect all over the world. So, I personally gotta tell you, I love this map. I really love the uh, attention to the detail that clearly went into it and that really plays a big role here. But I am uncertain, since provinces do not track any sort of uh, pop makeup, whether we won't just see basically a uh, uh, quite homogenous makeup of where pops take jobs and that all the Sudeten German are actually in Bohemia or rather in Prague now because that is where the jobs are, right? Um, it doesn't really play a role gameplay-wise since you can't pl split states outside of actually taking treaty ports, but it really just made me think I... Ultimately, I'm looking at a situation, I think, where it will end up being too broad of a, of a brushstroke. I hope you get what I mean here. When it comes to this, um, all in all, I'm very happy with the diversity again that we get here, with the actual appreciation of the variety of, of cultural uh, areas that we see here. I just think that as soon as you have a border area between two different cultures, if you have a minority in a particular state, that we might run into an issue where all of a sudden that minority, you know, claims this entire state, which I don't think was the case, <laughs> historically speaking, even when it comes to this or when it comes to other regions right there. Either way, this is a, a topic I think that will accom uh, accompany Victoria 3 for some time to come, and let's read it back in, let's actually go back to the dev diary content itself. Cultures work slightly differently. For one, you have descriptive, uh, descriptive traits, such as which language a culture generally speaks, for example, lusophone or his a hispanophone. You also have a special kind of trait called heritage, which generally describes very broadly where a certain culture originated from geographically. Some laws specifically require cultures to share heritage with the primary cultures for them to be accepted, such as national supremacy and racial segregation. There is also a cultural e exclusion, e exclusion, which requires at least a single trait to be shared for the culture to be accepted. Finally, multiculturalism accepts all cultures regardless of traits. So, here we have different sets of laws. We have national supremacy and racial segregation. Here you need to have the same heritage. This is just the way it is. And then you have cultural exclusion, which requires at least a single trait to be shared for the culture to be accepted. So, for example, if there was any other culture that had the Yamato trait, which I don't think is the case, that culture would also be accepted in Japanese. Um, or in, in, a, in a Japanese cultural exclusion country. I'm thinking the only usage case of Yamato, because basically what I'm saying is, right, if you look at cultural exclusion, and that requires at least a single trait to be shared for the culture to be accepted, 
and nobody else has Yamato, Yamato might not, might as well not be there, right? So I'm thinking maybe there's like a Japanese American. Basically, if if Japanese pops migrate, maybe there's a chance that I I don't I don't know. Um, but I'm looking at this. That's the only explanation where a different culture, where Japanese Americans, for example, may re-emigrate or re-migrate to Japan and then are accepted because they they have the Yamato trait. Uh, I'm actually not sure when it comes to this because they should still have the heritage trait, but. Yeah, either way, uh, I think Japan is a, is a bit, of, bit of an odd case here either way, because you're looking at a situation where most other cultures have their generic traits, so not their heritage traits, defined, for example, as their language and such. So, in general, I think the system makes perfect sense. You can build, for example, a state right here in Indonesia. I assume that they have a... a or most of these cultures here will have a, a common heritage, right? And then this heritage makes it so that they accept one another in the, for example... And national supremacy, whereas on the other hand, with a, gen a general trait, it depends on whether they speak the same language, and then they might sync up and otherwise discriminate against one another. I am very much looking forward to the gameplay here and the intricacies of it. Uh, I want to test all the edge cases and I want to create ridiculous situations, and I think that Victoria 3 is quite direct that, you know, they really put thought into how this works in general, so I would love to see it in action. Cultures work slightly differently. Uh, right, I already read that. Let's talk about the Inuit culture right here. You can see that this is the general overview. I gotta tell you, I really like the way these clothes look. Um, I have some issues with some of the clothes as they look currently in Victoria 3. They look really, really shiny, really reflective. These clothes look nice. I, I like the way these coats actually turn out. I think it it's really neat. And overall, I think the pops here look quite decent. Uh, lower strata, middle strata, and upper strata got new symbols as well. Looks really neat. Also, they have no obsessions, no taboos. They have two cultural traits, indigenous American heritage, and then indigenous North American heritage. So, if you just, uh, or not heritage, my apologies. If you discriminate exclusively based on heritage, then indigenous Americans will all be able to live in an Inuit state that does that. If you discriminate based on just a trait, right? The North Americans would be eligible to basically be uh, not discriminated against in general as well. The indigenous North Americans, I should say. So this is quite interesting as well, because again, here you can see how it works for them. And here we actually have a trait, indigenous North American, that would be applicable to not just the Inuits. Again, I, th I think Yamato should just be applicable to the Japanese, but maybe I'm completely wrong. Please do correct me in the comments. Closely tied to cultures and religions are the concepts of taboos and obsessions. Both of these affect, either negatively or positively, how much pops are willing to pay for and consume certain goods. As such, both taboos and obsessions are only, uh, only applied to consumer goods as opposed to military or industrial goods. So no tank obsessions, sorry. Obsessions are tied to culture. For instance, the French culture being obsessed with wine or the Nepali with tea. As you might have guessed, taboos, on the other hand, are tied to religion. Importantly, though, they still manifest themselves culturally. Every culture has a religion tied to it and inherits the taboos from that religion. This means that a, a Catholic Turkish pop will still have a taboo against wine and liquor, for instance. See, I'm curious here. If I have a Turkish pop and the Turkish culture throughout the game shifts from Islam, so from Sunni Islam, shifts to Catholicism or shifts to Hinduism, Will the culture, so, you know, let's say 90% at the start, I don't, I don't know the actual values, let's say 95% of Turkish pops at the start of the game are Sunni, and then at some point in the game, 60, 50, 50, 50% 50 point X, right, just a tiny majority, all of a sudden of the Turkish pops is Hindu. Do they change their taboo, or does the taboo stick around until the very point of the end of the game? Like, does it never change? That is a question that I do have. I assume that even if it stuck around and wouldn't change, even if the majority religion changed, which is not very likely, mind you, in the time frame of Victoria 3, it's just 100 years after all, but if you did that, could you mod it in that an event basically fires and says, boom, all of a sudden the taboo changed? It's not that important, of course. This is basically just, okay, you have a fundamental culture that is influenced by this religion and that has adopted this as their tradition on a, on a cultural level. I think this makes perfect sense. The taboos coming from the religion is, is perfectly fine by me. The obsessions, of course, are much more rapidly changing because that is something like a cultural fad, you can almost say. I'm, I'm at peace with this. I'm just curious whether it could change if I did something radical like fundamentally changing the religion of a culture in general. So where all of a sudden 100% of that culture actually have a different religion. Uh, here we can see the Nepali. And here as well we see the uh, Himalayan trait and the South Asian heritage. I would guess that the Himalayan trait makes it so that if you just need a trait that they have in common, you would look at the... For example, Tibetans. Let's say Tibetans don't have South Asian heritage. Uh, maybe the case, right? But you could still 
have Nepali not discriminated in a Tibetan state if both of them have the Himalayan trait. So this is exactly how that works. This is how you get to that situation. They will then still discriminate against other folks, right? But those two would all of a sudden be uh, indeed uh, uh, quite do dealing with one another quite okay in a Tibetan state because they wouldn't discriminate against one another. Uh, that is how these traits and how these trait laws basically work, just to get back to that. Religion here is Hindu and Gelukpa, and then the obsession is tea and the taboo is meat. The tea stems from the Nepali simply as a culture having this as an obsession right now, whereas the taboo stems from the actual religion, which is Hindu. Uh, Nepali culture is not discriminated in Nepal, of course, 619k population, primary culture in Nepal, yes, no migration target and no turmoil. And Another difference between obsessions and taboos is that while taboos don't change throughout the game, obsessions are more fleeting and can emerge organically or be, re be removed in case something significant happens, like the opium crisis for instance. If a certain good is abundantly available in a market, the pops in that market have a small chance of becoming obsessed with it. See, I'm, I'm so curious about this, whether other things can also trigger obsessions. I feel like something being rare could also trigger an obsession, basically where it's like, you know what? My, my grandma told me about tea, it was great, I would like to have it, but we don't have enough, I'm obsessed with it, please give it to me, right? I would be very eager to find out about that, um, because if it's always just common, it doesn't sound like it's all that bad, but obsessions, I feel, sometimes can also be bad as cultural fads, because they create shortages, right? Well, um, either way, the fundamental condition, of course, is that if something is so common that it's an everyday object, it's an obsession that you just need to have, otherwise you can't really function, that definitely is bad the abundance usage case that they have right here. So uh, I just want to know whether there are also other triggers, but we already know that the opium crisis, for example, indeed gets journal entries in particular. I wonder how common journal entries for obsessions are in general as well. Uh, but that is something that I will have to ask the devs at PDXCon, I think. Here we have uh, Pui Witsi uh, Kwazu, uh, I think is how that is pronounced, probably not, Penateka. He is the chieftain of the Comanche, and he's a ruling politician, a landowner, a pacifist, a neutral popularity, not all that... Uh, beloved, I think that is because of the arrogant trait, right? This is a direct connection if I'm not mistaken here. He is 43 years old and he is a traditionalist commander and I gotta tell you yet again, I like his outfit. I, I really, really like the way that this looks. I think that is pretty neat. Uh, more unique background could be nice as well, but I mean, again, that brings us to the same topic that we already discussed quite a bit when it comes to the question of how much variety can you have in a 1.0 game in a game that spans the entire globe. It's not comparable really to CK3, right, where it's just a fairly uh, limited amount of space, quite big as well, but still fairly limited compared to the entire world, and then of course around 100 years uh, with as much modern uh, modernization and technology as we have in Victoria 3. Cultures and religions touch on most of the game's mechanics in one way or another, as can be seen from previous dev diaries. From mechanics related to secessions, migrations and unifications, all the way to discrimination, political strength and conversion slash assimilation. Cultures are also tied to visual changes such as the appearance of characters. When playing Victoria 3, you will often be thinking about cultures in one way or another. On top of all that, it might interest some of you that cultures and religions are very easily moddable to do what you want. Below you can find a quick blog culture mod I made with some details like localization files omitted. Right, uh, localization is its own thing, you just gotta write some stuff. Let's take a look at this. Blogs. Their cultural traits are outer space heritage and clingy. In this case, and this will actually be so interesting, modders need to consider that, that the traits need to have people that share them so that the cultural laws actually mean something, right? But in this case, uh, no, nobody else would be clingy, nobody else would have outer space heritage, right? But these are the cultural traits of the blog. The religion is 100% friendship, the obsession is fish, again, this is a cultural thing, and then the taboo is clothes, which is a friendship thing, and may never change even if you change the religion of the entire Blork population. Very curious, again, very pu uh, curious about that because it clearly bleeds through from religion to culture and the majority religion may change. Whether it Honestly, I'm, I'm very curious about this. You can still talk about something, obviously, where even if I take somebody like uh, a Turkish population that is Sunni, right, and I convert all of them to Catholicism, they may still very much practice the old Sunni tradition, which in this case would be no alcohol, for example, right? Uh, I'm very curious about this, because I do think it makes sense that you can't shake these taboos, but, you know, for some edge cases, I, I would be quite interested in how it actually plays. Now, you can see the blue culture is in Sweden. They're discriminated against by the Swedish, and there's a high level of turmoil, uh, turmoil right there. 
As you can see, the modding itself is very simple, even though I glossed over a few details like, like localization files and properly defining cultural traits, as well as actually creating a pop with a blue culture. But all of that is very straightforward. Now, let's take a look at this, because these, so this information here is actually quite easy to read. You're going to see this as well. They have basically here, uh, Alex took the time to show us the code for the culture and for the religion. Let's take a look at what that is, because there is something right here that I think explains why the game is completely incapable of actually tracking dynasties in gameplay. Such a such a tangent, right? I know, but I, I was looking at this and I saw, oh yeah, okay, this actually explains it. It's very modular, but it can't do that. Uh, let's take a look. The blog. First, you define the color on the map. Makes sense. Then you take a look at what religion is associated with the uh, blog. In this case, it's friendship, which then further is defined right here in a different file, right? Um, the traits are outer space heritage and clingy. We saw that as well. I assume that anything that ends uh, uh, in heritage could already be basically telling the game, okay, the heritage law applies for this very trait because it reads heritage at the end, of course, right? Maybe you need to define that somewhere else, though. I, I'm not actually certain. Then you have the obsession, which is fish. We have the male common first name, which is in this case Blog. You can add a bunch of names here, which is basically just a random name list, right? And then we have regal last names. And this made me think... Um, we discussed this several times, that if I'm a monarchy, let's say, for example, I'm France, I have Napoleon III Bonaparte on my throne, I kick him out, become a republic, and then I go back to being a monarchy, I can't say, put the Bonapartes back onto the throne. I can't say that, because the Bonapartes aren't remembered like that. That guy was just some guy. And if, you know, his heir, obviously, had we stayed a, a monarchy, would have always been a Bonaparte, because that is exactly how it works. But fundamentally, it doesn't track any of the dynasties. It just generates a new character underneath this that becomes the heir and has the same last name, the same regal name, right? And this is essentially where they pull that from. If I am France, I have a Bonaparte, I get rid of the monarchy, I reinstitute the monarchy, we would be looking at a situation where it could be a Bonaparte because this random regal last name list would select it from there. Or it could be, a, I don't know, a Bourbon, a Valois, right? Anything like that that may have existed in this time frame that makes sense from uh, this point of view. This ultimately means that, similar to Solaris, very similar to Solaris, um, this is just a random name list that gets picked from. Once you are locked in, it, it will pick the same regal last in the same dynasties, right? But it won't go and say, oh, wait a minute, we're bringing this dynasty back. It will say, we're just bringing somebody back and I'm drawing from this list for a random last name. I wonder whether dynasty tracking is something that could be modded in in one form or another. It's not that important, but it's definitely something that like goes through my head, right? If if I uh, if I'm Russia, if I'm uh, Prussia, I should say, and the Hohenzollern get ousted, and then we go back to monarchy, I would kind of like the Hohenzollern to be back, right? Uh, getting just a random name, it doesn't feel as flavorful. Uh, yeah, at the very least, like some event that says, okay, what's going to be the dynasty, even if it doesn't track anything. But if you could just click some event for roleplaying, it could be pretty okay. But yeah, this clearly indicates it's a name list. It's not actually, there's no dynasty tracking, there's nothing like that. Then down here we have the religion, friendship, traits, alien. Okay, so this is the uh, religious measure, right? This is the alien religion. There could be other alien religions that then wouldn't discriminate against one another if you had the, um, the consciousness law or conscience, whereas uh, they discriminate against everybody else, right? Then you have the taboo here, the clothes, right? Makes perfect sense. And then you define the color. This... What, what I what I gotta tell you about these blocks of codes is that this is really simple, this is really easy to do, really modular. And I think that is exactly the way it should be, because this should be able to basically accommodate for any mod, right? Whether it's a fantasy conversion, whether it's a, a conversion based on historical circumstances where you have a point of deviation, for example, whether it's in the future, whether it's a modern day mod, whether it's, for example, the Cold War, whether it is, I don't know, an antiquity mod, why not, right? All of those should be viable when it comes to cultural and religious point of views because you, you, you can be very, very, very uh, deliberate with how religions and cultures classify themselves and how others classify them. You can work with the heritage in particular, you can work maybe even with several heritages, I wonder whether you can do that, I don't see anything that would block it, right? Why couldn't I just write in here European heritage, for example? Um... I think the way they have made culture and religion, where it is such a generally, like, constantly existing part in your gameplay, but never a primary part, because you're looking at your society as the primary part, and culture and religion fundamentally influence that society, 
but they are not like, for example, CK3, right? Where culture and religion are these things where you change specific uh, objects that you do when you reform a culture, when you diverge, when you hybridize, that sort of stuff. None of that plays a role here because culture and religion aren't that important, but they're important to be the framework for your society gameplay. The way this is done is really neat. It has been clarified now. I think that is very, very nice. I will definitely stick with my concerns when it comes to the question of, uh, you know, for example, the, the Zodaten areas, or when it even comes to this, right? When it comes to any area where there clearly is a minority population that lives in a very highly localized location, I think it might be better if we had a, basically like a cultural state region that exists for this circumstance, because otherwise you're going to end up with Bohemia being largely German, or rather not Bohemia, Prague being largely German, because that is where they go to have jobs, they're not discriminated against, so they can pick up all the high education jobs, that sort of stuff, right? Um, yeah, I, I wish that there was some more nuance there, but I also think it's difficult because I'm sure that most of the world would basically declare, hey, this, you know, is, is not going to reflect the reality of the situation as soon as you unpause because then people will find jobs that are not where they actually live because it's not pre uh, not actually uh, a scene on the per province level but on the per state level, right? Uh, this is a concern that I have. I think this will uh, be something that accompanies Victoria 3 for quite some time to come. Uh, the other thing was, of course, about the ruling dynasty, which isn't all that important, but yeah. This was this dev diary. Again, on the 30th is that stream. Uh, the next dev diary apparently will be Mikhail telling us a bit more about the journey so far. I'm very excited for that. At that point, we will already know when the release date is. Let's hope that we don't have to wait for all that much longer. Let me know what you thought about this dev diary, and I'll leave it here. I will see you later, alligator.